Well, welcome everybody, great to have you here with us today. And as always, wanna say a big welcome to our locations. Grateful to have each of you guys with us to Central Summerlin and Sunrise Mountain, Southern Highlands, to those in the Kingman family, and uh, those who are joining us in our uh, partnership with God Behind Bars and different prison facilities. Those who are watching online, thank you guys. Well, hey, we had some excitement at the Wilhite House this week. Um, we have this 11 and a half year old bulldog named Roxy, and if you've been around Central, I've talked about her a lot over the years. Absolutely love this dog, sort of, although she's getting older now and she's slowing down and she can't really see much anymore and she can't really hear very well anymore and she's having some incontinence issues, if you know what I'm talking about right now, and it's just like one thing after another, right? But, but we, we love her. So she goes out in the backyard and uh, we, uh, we moved a few years ago, bought an older house and had a pool. So we never had a pool before, but she, she was fine, you know, like there was water, everything was fine, you know. I always feel like a pool, you know, like the kids will swim in it to get, right. <laughs> anyway, money pit. <laughs> and it needs to be replastered, but that's a whole other conversation. But she's out by the pool, hanging out, and all of a sudden, we hear this splash. Roxy, the 11 and a half year old bulldog, fell into the pool. Now, your dog falls into the pool, and that's probably okay for a few minutes because they can, like, doggy paddle, right? You know, and they can keep their head up and all that. But if you've ever seen a bulldog, that ain't happening, man. A bulldog falls in the pool, and it's, like, straight down like a rock. <laughs> like, it's over. And so I kind of hear this splash. I'm, I'm in the kitchen, and I, I hear the, a splash, and it doesn't even register to me what's happening. And then all of a sudden, Lori's sitting in the backyard talking on the phone. I hear her scream. She throws her phone and runs and jumps in the pool, leather jacket and all. The whole deal, right? <laughs> Grabs Roxy. She can't get her out of the pool. That was kind of funny when I, because I'm like, did Lori just jump in the pool? Is that what I just heard? So, so I walk around the corner, you know, I kind of look in the backyard, and, and you know, Lori takes everything she's got to keep Roxy's head above water, you know, and she can't, she can't get her up out of the pool. So I come over and get down on my knees, and we finally get Roxy up on the ledge. It was our Baywatch moment <laughs> right there. Here's a picture of Lori uh, right after this happened. She's soaking wet, you can't even tell, but actually her clothes are totally wet. But look at Roxy, like, I don't think she has any idea what happened to her this week. I think she's like, I don't know, I was walking along, then it was wet, and then I was saved, because that's what happens to me, and here I am. Like, she's just sort of Roxy, you know, I don't know. But I was thinking about that image, because you know how terrible it would have been if she would have drowned? right there in the pool. I mean, I'm like, we'd have had to sell this house. You know, the kids would never get in that pool again. I wouldn't have to replaster it. That'd be awesome. But, you know, like, like seriously, in the next house, no pool, people. But, like, it would have been absolutely tragic. And I think about life because there's a lot of times in our lives where we just feel like we're going underwater. You know, where we feel like we're, we're drowning. You know, we can't. Some of you may be there right now with school. You just feel like with all the papers and tests and all the responsibilities and things, it just feels overwhelming. Some of you may feel that way with work. Uh, I feel that way as it relates to political ads right now. Can we just put us out of our misery, right? Um, you know, like all, all this stuff flying around, all this stress, all this pressure, it can just feel like, you know, you're going under. You're, you're barely keeping your head above water or you're sinking. And sometimes when we're overwhelmed, the temptation for me, and I think for many of us, is to just try and pull ourselves up by our own bootstraps, is to try and, you know, do whatever we can do in our own strength to get up out of that situation. But the good news today is that God promises to help us. And he promises um, to work in our hearts and in our lives. We've been in this series we kicked off called Uncaged, looking at some of the top promises of God in the Bible, and he's made many of them. But one of the amazing promises of God is simply this. He says, I will send my spirit. We have the resource of God's spirit available to us today, each one of us. You're not alone. Even if you're drowning, if you're going underwater, <laughs> you're not alone. And God can help you in that moment if you'll allow him to. In fact, let's look at what Jesus says about the Holy Spirit. John chapter 14, Jesus is talking to his followers. He's, getting, he's kind of preparing them because he's about to face betrayal and crucifixion and then resurrection. And he's kind of getting them ready for what's happening. And 
They're going to be overwhelmed in that season, so they're, they're going to feel like they're going under in that season. And here's how he kind of sets it up. Check this out. When we get to the red word, uh, we'll bring this up on the screen. Read it out loud here with me. But John chapter 14, beginning in verse 16, Jesus says this. I will ask the Father, and he will give you another, what? Advocate. You see that? Yeah, an advocate who will never leave you. That's a cool, that's a cool statement. He'll never leave you. He's the Holy Spirit who leads into all truth. The world cannot receive him because it isn't looking for him and doesn't recognize him, but you know him because he lives with you now and later will be in you. No, I will not abandon you as orphans. I will come to you. So Jesus is telling them in this moment, look, I'm gonna go away. But he's, and in fact, right before this, he actually makes this statement. He says, it's better if I go away. Because if I go away, then the Spirit will come. And so we have an advocate. Turn to the person next to you and say, I have an advocate. You have an advocate. Now that's a very rich word. Some translations translate that word as um, a, uh, the comforter, the encourager, the helper, the advocate. One of my favorite ways of understanding the Holy Spirit is the, the history of that word advocate goes all the way back to uh, wealthy families in the ancient world, and some of these families were wealthy enough to have an attorney on a retainer for the family, okay? So any, any legal matters come up, any issues come up, right? You just got this attorney on retainer always available who then comes and represents you as your what? Advocate. And that's the idea. Jesus says the Holy Spirit is our advocate, always on retainer, if you will, always there available in our lives to help us. So we may go through seasons where we feel like we're drowning. We may feel like we're overwhelmed. We may even feel like we're alone, but it's the Holy Spirit that leads us into truth, and it's God's Spirit that can help us in those moments. In fact, one of the things I've noticed in my own life about God, and I wish it wasn't true, I've just experienced this. Many of you have experienced this. Sometimes God allows me to find myself in a situation where I feel overwhelmed. Because it's precisely in that moment when I realize that I need his spirit and I lean on him in his spirit and I find a strength that I didn't know I had before. I don't like being in that situation, right? But sometimes I find myself in that situation and I, I can't tell you when I find myself in that situation, I look around and I go, oh yeah, I see what God's doing. Because <laughs> I don't, I'm like, God, where are you? What are you doing to me? But sometimes in the middle of it or looking back later, you realize God's moving and working even there to provide help for you in your life. I believe we can move from being overwhelmed to being overflowing by depending on God's spirit on a daily basis in our lives. He's the helper, he's the advocate, he's the encourager, and he's available to you today. So I wanna talk to you about how we can um, live in the promise of God's spirit. First, let's just talk about how we can receive the spirit's help in our life, how we can receive the spirit's help. Um, I hope you all had a good Halloween. Um, I don't know if you trick-or-treated or you got lots of candy or you carved pumpkins. I'm not sure kind of what your family tradition is. A lot of people carve pumpkins of scary things like this one right here, the typical jack-o'-lantern pumpkin, you know, scary pumpkin. Uh, other people started to take this a little further and carve pumpkins of things that actually frightened them <laughs> in their life. Check this uh, next pumpkin out. That's a low battery charge pumpkin. You ever wake up and you see that on your phone and now that's scary in the morning all right here's another one this one represents uh, student loans that's scary every month right here's another one this is scary when the check engine light comes on you want to talk about fear here it is when we talk about the Holy Spirit I think you know some of us that's a little bit of a frightening topic you know people don't really always know what to do with that um, the old King James Version of the Bible used to translate Holy Spirit as Holy Ghost, which in and of itself is kind of spooky, right? When you think about it, I remember as a kid being like, the Holy what? You know, like Casper the Friendly Ghost, he's not a bad ghost, he's a good ghost, like what's up with the ghost 
language and conversation. And we can get, you know, sometimes a little bit freaked out by the Holy Spirit. Sometimes we can be a little bit of afraid of like, if I really surrender to God and really allow God's Spirit to move and work in my life, you know, what if he's gonna call me to go to some foreign land as a missionary? Or, you know, what if he's gonna, you know, make me take these steps in my personal life that I don't, I don't wanna take? And we, we can live with fear because we're afraid that surrender is gonna lead us to doing all these things that we don't want to do. And I just want to encourage you today that surrender to God's spirit is not something we should be afraid about. It actually will lead to the life that you and I really want. It'll lead to the life that we really want. I'll show you what I mean uh, before we're done uh, today as we look to the Bible together. But it will lead to a life that's filled with the good things that we ultimately desire in our lives. So God's spirit is available. His spirit is powerful. It's not something we should be afraid of. It's something we should welcome in our heart and in our lives. In fact, I went through the New Testament of the Bible and just wrote down all the different things that the Bible says God's spirit does in our lives. So we're going to just fly over the New Testament, the latter part of the Bible at 50,000 feet, and I'm going to kind of read to you all the things the Bible says the Holy Spirit does. It says, the Holy Spirit empowers you to love. He reveals the deep things of God. He enables you to declare Jesus is Lord. He distributes gifts to those who believe. He unifies the church. He brings freedom. He gives you access to the Father. He strengthens you with power in your inner being. He makes you righteous and holy. He sets you apart as a child of God and builds you in the person you are meant to become. He empowers you to speak God's good news to others. He gives you the energy to accomplish things that matter. He helps you understand and recall the teachings of Jesus. He leads and directs you in serving God. He comforts you, fills you with joy, fills you with hope, gives you discernment, compels you to act, pours the love of God into your heart, helps you in your weakness, prays for you when you don't know how to pray, and pleads your case before God. He's your advocate, your helper, your defense attorney, a down payment on heaven, the presence and power of God living within you, promising to complete the work that Jesus began in you on the day that you believed. That's what the Holy Spirit does. And that's a lot, right? That's a lot. Now, when we talk about the Holy Spirit, we're talking about a person. Um, and, you know, some people think, you know, the Holy Spirit and the Holy Ghost, and we sort of talk about the Holy Spirit like an it. But the New Testament writers speak of the Holy Spirit as a person in personal language. Theologians in the Christian faith, uh, believers and thinkers for years have talked about God as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. There's one God and three Persons. And so when we talk about the Holy Spirit, we're not talking about it, we're talking about him. <laughs> it's, it's God, you know, and his representation in our heart and in our lives as we follow him in faith. And God's spirit can move and work to help us. In fact, his spirit in many of our lives has already been moving and working in powerful ways. Listen to this, Ephesians chapter one, uh, beginning in verse 13, we get to the red word, we'll read it out, together, loud, out loud together. Ephesians 1, 13, it says, it's in Christ that you, once you heard the truth and believed it, this message of your salvation, found yourselves home free. So he's saying, look, many of you, some of you are not yet followers of Jesus, and I'm thrilled that you're here, and I believe one day you will be a follower of Jesus. Uh, many of you are followers of Jesus, and you've already crossed that line of faith. But look at what the Bible's saying. It's saying, look, when you heard the truth and you believed it, you found yourselves home free. Look at this, signed, sealed, and delivered by who? The Holy Spirit. It's the Holy Spirit who was working in us even before we understood what God's Spirit was doing. It says, um, this signet from God is the first what? Installment on what's coming. A reminder that we'll get everything God's planned for us, a praising and glorious life. So the Holy Spirit is like a down payment on heaven, if you will. It's like the first payment, right? We talked in week one of this uh, teaching series about how God's presence is really the greatest promise throughout the Bible, and his spirit is his presence in our lives, not only today, but ultimately in heaven. And so even now, we have the down payment on that promise ultimately coming to fulfillment. And so we can receive the spirit's help, and in fact, we already have received the Spirit's help in many, many ways in our hearts and in our lives. And so in your life, in my life this week, my challenge to you is to think about what it means 
when you're overwhelmed, when situations feel uh, you know, incredibly difficult, to lean into the spirit in your life and to derive power and strength from God and who he is. Um, I know in my life, I, one of, a powerful passage for me was always uh, Ephesians 5.18. It says, uh, don't be drunk with wine. Hello. But, which is not so much a prohibition against alcohol, but it's an, it's an illustration about influence. Because here's what it says. Don't be drunk with wine. Because when you're drunk with wine, what happens? Well, you know, you're under the influence of something else, right? You know, you can make dumb choices. People can put lampshades on their head, dance on tables at parties, and do things. The next morning, they're like, hey, man, what did I do? You know? Paul says, don't be drunk with wine. Instead, he says, be filled with the Spirit. So the illustration is, you and I choose what we're going to allow to influence us. Right, and he's saying allow God's spirit to influence you, come under the influence of the Holy Spirit. Now, there's some things that we can do to come under that influence, right? Just like there's some things that you could do to get drunk, right? Open a bottle, drink. You gotta do some things. You don't just like wake up and be like, I don't know, I'm just drunk. <laughs> and this is Paul's illustration, right? Ephesians five, this is Paul's illustration. It's the same principle with the Holy Spirit. There's some things that you and I can do to come under the influence of the Holy Spirit, to receive the Spirit's help in our lives. Now, on the one hand, we just read in Ephesians chapter 1 that the Spirit is a down payment in our lives, that even as we started to believe and started that spiritual journey and came to a place of faith that God's Spirit was already working in our lives and already doing much of that work in our lives, which is awesome. So we are uh, already influenced by the Holy Spirit and when you become a follower of Jesus, I believe you have God's spirit within you and you're sealed. The Bible talks about the sealing of God's spirit. You're marked with God's spirit and he's with you through the very end. But Paul also talks about being filled. So even though you're sealed by the spirit, you still have to daily, regularly be filled by the spirit, come under the influence of the spirit. I'll just talk you through how I do this in my life. And it's a constant um, challenge. But for me, uh, I daily will ask the Holy Spirit to fill me. Just, it's a little prayer that I say, you know, just Holy Spirit, fill me, you know. I, I often pray this prayer, even before I get up to speak, you know, fill me. Um, sometimes when I'm really stressed out during the day, I will just stop and open my hand like this. And I don't make a big deal about it. Nobody else needs to see it. You know, you're at work, you can just sort of turn around. But it's just a reminder, like, just give that to God, let that go. Surrender to what God's doing in this moment, even if you don't understand it. God, I'm just, I'm letting go of that, I'm giving that to you. That's <laughs> more than I wanna, I'm drowning, so I'm gonna give you that weight. Um, another thing that I do is, uh, you know, I listen to music. Paul, in Ephesians chapter five, he talks about, he says, um, don't get drunk with the wine, instead be filled with the Holy Spirit. And then, he's, then he gives us a, a, this list of things that we can do that help us not only be filled, but come under the influence of the Holy Spirit. And the list is this, he says, sing songs and hymns uh, uh, to, to one another. In other words, sing, worship, music. Why do we come together at church and we sing and we worship? It, we get filled, right? We get filled back up so we can go back into the week and face all the challenges that we have to face. And so that's one way that we can come under the influence of the Holy Spirit. He says, give thanks to God. So I find that on a regular basis, I have to stop and in my own life, just give thanks to God for what he's doing, focus on what he's already uh, done in my life, focus on the many gifts of people and love and relationships that he's given to me in my life. And that's the way we come under the influence of the spirit. And so wherever you're at, if you're overwhelmed this week, just pause and realize you're not alone. You have an advocate and a helper who is with you who can do all kinds of things in your heart and in your life if you'll just depend on him and surrender to him. So we, we wanna receive the Spirit's help. Second principle is this, respect the Spirit's guidance. Respect the Spirit's guidance. So I've started, um, like I'm four months in doing strength training. And I don't know if you've ever done any strength training, but I'm talking like, I, and I, you know, I, I couldn't find the time to go to the gym. I do most of this stuff before the sun comes up, right? It's like really early, uh, which is not the best time to be lifting heavy weights. But, um, I got a, a, a squat rack, and I got a barbell, and I got some plates, and I found this company that does online strength training. I don't know if you ever, it's a new world we live in, people. 
So what I mean is I have this set routine that the trainer sends me and you know, I go through these workouts and then at the last set I have to record on my phone and video it and then I have to send it back. You know? And so every one of my, and the reason I do that is because then the trainer comments on my form and all of this and coaches me to have good form, which you, know, you need when you start lifting heavier weights, right? So, so I'm doing this thing called the squat like, like three days a week for the last four months. Now, I don't know if you've ever done the squat, but I'm just gonna, I'm gonna, give, I'm gonna do the squat for you right here. You know, you get your, get your feet about like this. You got a barbell on your back, right, with some weight. And then the whole idea is you go down and then you go up. <laughs> if I blow my pants out next service, that won't be good. So, no problem right now, but you get a couple hundred pounds on your back, that starts to get heavy, you know? Like, at first it was fun. I'm like, oh, this is cool. I'm doing strength training and I'm old. <laughs> it's not cool anymore, man. I'm like four months in now. I'm doing deadlifts with hundreds of pounds. This hurts. It's brutal. I get in there and I'm like, oh, I hate this. Maybe I'll just let myself go. I don't want to do this. Maybe I don't care about being healthy. Maybe it doesn't matter, right? You're just, you know, anyway. <laughs> you ever been there? Like, I'll take you deep into my self-talk. It's really scary down in there, right? I'm like, I don't know, but I keep getting up. I keep doing it, but my trainer keeps coming along, and, and uh, I, I have to send these videos off, and then she sends me back comments, and she nitpicks every single thing I do, and she tells me, your feet aren't wide enough apart. Your stance isn't right. That's why you're on your toes. I'm like, I'm not on my toes. Then I have to go back and watch the video. Yep, I'm on my toes. And so, you know, like, you're not going deep enough. I'm four months in doing the squat three days a week, and I'm a squat idiot. I still can't do it perfectly. But I keep leaning into her. She's actually great. I really like her. I, she'll probably watch this message. Hi, Alexis. Um, <laughs> she, she's always pushing me to go further and to do better. And so I listen to, I respect her guidance, because first of all, she can squat way more than I can, and she can deadlift way more than I can. I respect her guidance because by respecting her guidance, I believe it will have a positive impact and influence on my life, mostly, I think. And I think the Holy Spirit wants to come along in our lives and not just be a resource of strength when we're tired and exhausted, but also a trainer. If we'll respect the Spirit's guidance in our life, if we'll lean into where the Spirit is nudging us and leaning us in our life, we can experience... Um, more of just a sense of the reality of God every day in our lives. In fact, look at what Galatians chapter five, verse 25 says. Um, Paul writes these words. He says, if we live by the Spirit, let us also keep in what? Keep in step. You see that? So he's like, we're already living by the Spirit. We've been signed, sealed, and delivered by the Spirit. God's Spirit helped bring us to salvation. God's Spirit's already moving and working in our life. But notice, we're also supposed to keep in step with the Spirit. We gotta walk with the Spirit. We gotta surrender to the Spirit and be open to what God's Spirit would have us do and how he would have us live. And then he says, let us not become conceited, provoking one another instead, or, or, or envying one another. So we've gotta respect the Spirit's guidance in our life, and that's not something to fear. Maybe you're having a conversation with somebody, and maybe you just sense that you know, God is guiding this conversation. I had a friend of mine, uh, Pastor Tim Scott uh, in San Diego, longtime friend of mine, dear friend, and he's telling me this story, this amazing story. I gotta share it with you. This last week he says um, he'd gone with some business leaders um, to Jordan, and in the midst of this business trip several years ago, they got an audience with King Abdullah. Whoa. So they're sitting with the king, there's an interpreter, and they're going around introducing themselves. And he said when he walks in and he looks at King Abdullah, he looks exactly, exactly like his father who had passed away. So he's getting emotional, he's choking up because it's like, oh my gosh, the guy looks just like my dad. So he's sitting there, they go around the table and and he says, you know, the first person says, I'm so-and-so, and I represent uh, the President of the United States of America, and everybody represented somebody, right? I'm so-and-so, and I represent this business, and I'm so-and-so, and I represent, right? And they get to him, and he's planning on saying, you know, 
I'm Tim, and I I'm, I'm represent this business. I'm kind of just coming along for the ride. And in this moment, he said, he doesn't know what came over him. He just said, I'm Tim Scott. By, by the way, the president, uh, uh, King Abdullah, is Muslim. He says, uh, I'm, I'm Tim Scott, and I represent the king of the universe, Jesus Christ. <laughs> Can you <laughs> And he said he had that moment of like, dude, what are you doing? Like outside of himself, like shut your mouth. Oh my gosh. Just said that to the king. And he said the whole room, everybody's like, uh, what just happened down there? You know, like what is going on? And he felt that pressure, but he was getting emotional because he reminded him of his dad. And so the king says to the interpreter, to him, he says, why, why is he becoming emotional? So Tim reaches in his wallet, pulls out a picture of his dad, gives it to the interpreter who takes it over to the king. King looks at his dad and, and smiles, realizes they, they look exactly like each other. Gets up, goes over to Tim, hugs him, embraces him, kisses him on both cheeks, and they have a 30-minute conversation, just he and the king through that interpreter. King Abdullah asks him, Tell me about your father. Tell me about your faith. Tell me about your background. Tell me about your life. And he said all these other leaders sat there and listened to this whole thing happen, and then it was over, and they all left. <laughs> Sometimes God's spirit can move in our lives in big, dramatic way, right? You just, you, you ever been in a conversation and said something, and you're like, oh, I can't believe I just said that. I don't mean it in a bad way. And all of a sudden you sense there's something bigger than you going on. Uh, but then many times when the spirit works in our lives, it's very subtle, right? It's not always so direct. Those, those stories are few and far between, but they're awesome, right? But they're few and far between. Many of the stories in our lives would be simple and subtle. The Hebrew word for spirit, ruach, it's a fascinating word because it could be translated wind or breath. Those are two very different things, right? Like the wind is unbridled power and strength. If you've ever been outside when uh, you know, we get certain winds in our area that just come through and it's unbelievable, right? Gusts that flip 18 wheelers over on their side and blow all your backyard furniture into your neighbor's yard. You know, you're just like run for the wind that shakes the windows. Wind is untamed and unbridled and powerful and strong. And that's the spirit. Sometimes he moves in our lives in very powerful ways like that, but it's also breath. Breath is intimate, right? We breathe thousands of times a day. We've been sitting here breathing in and out, in and out, and we're not even aware that it's happening and I think the picture is appropriate. God is both wind, power, strength. You can't always see him, but you see the, the, the effects of him moving. But he's also breath. He's present. He's imminent within us. And as we follow him, he, he dwells within us and he works, sometimes in very subtle ways, in our hearts and in our lives. He's moving. He's working. And here's the end result of God's spirit, if we'll respect his guidance. Galatians chapter 5, verse 22 says, The Holy Spirit produces this kind of what? Fruit. <laughs> this kind of fruit in our lives. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. There is no law against these things. It's one of my favorite verses. And I think it's one of my favorite verses because I think it's what we all really want. I mean, who doesn't want love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, self-control? Like, who doesn't want that stuff? This is why I say if, if you sense God is guiding you or leading you in your life, follow his leading. You don't have to be afraid because what it's gonna result in is a life that you really want, a life filled with love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, self-control. So maybe this week you'll find yourself in a conversation and 
you'll sense God just sort of nudging you like, you know, share your story, share what I've done in your life. And, you know, I have to make a choice, you know, in that moment. Do I, do I go with that? Is it appropriate? And, and if so, sometimes you just got to push through and take the risk and step out. Or maybe you'll have an opportunity to help somebody, to be generous to somebody this week. And you sense God just nudging you to do that. And surrender to his spirit. Respect his guidance in your life. And remember, it's going to lead to love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, self-control. Maybe you be in a conversation with somebody and, you know, there's some things that get thrown around and some accusations made and you want to be defensive and you want to come right back at them and you're kind of gearing up and you've got your argument, you're, you're watching their lips move while they talk, but you're building your counter argument in your mind the whole time, right? Come on, somebody. And you're thinking like, oh yeah, it just, keep, just keep doing this because I'm about to back it up, right? But instead... You just sense the Holy Spirit nudging you like that's not going to, you may win that battle, but you're going to lose the war. That's not the way. That's not the way. And so you keep your mouth shut and you allow that moment God to do what he wants to do. There's a lot of ways we can follow the Spirit's guidance in our life. And I'll be the first to tell you that what we're talking about is a little bit subjective, and it's, it's a mystery. It's hard. Like, this is a hard message. When I was working on it, I'm like, how do I really talk about God's Spirit's work in people's lives without weirding them out and at the same time, you know, acknowledging that this is a mystery and it's, you know, sometimes it's hard to know what God is leading us to do. And that's true for me and for all of us. But I hang on to the promise. I have an advocate. I hang on to the promise, God's Spirit. He's around me like my breath. He's powerful like the wind and more. And I can lean into him for help, for encouragement, for comfort in my life. So every day, I'm just saying, God, fill me with your spirit. When I get stressed out, I open my hand. God, I give all this stuff to you. I depend on you. I'm following you. When I sense that God's nudging me, hey, Judd, you need to walk, walk a little more slowly. You need to listen to somebody who's hurting then I'm gonna lean into that, right? I've learned, like, lean into that. Let God move in that. Sometimes I've made leadership decisions that don't always make sense on paper, right? But you, you just sense this is what God is leading us to do. We wanna be a people, and we wanna be a church that is open to the leading of God's Spirit in our lives, right? Because it's God's church. Oh, I'll, I'll tell you, all is bright is an awesome initiative. And that initiative is really all about blessing kids this holiday season. And I remember several years ago when we began to dream about what that could be like. I just remember kind of looking at it on paper. I remember we were at a time as a church where at the season we were in, things were really tight financially in our own world. And I wasn't sure how we could afford to be generous. You know what I'm talking about? But as a church, we made the commitment and the decision, it's not about us, right? It's about helping others. It's about helping kids. It's about helping incarcerated families, kids who may not have Christmas and being a part of that. And it's been one of the most amazing ministries that we've done. I'm so excited about helping like 15,000 kids this year. And I've learned the question as a church isn't, can we afford it? It's just not the right question. It's, is God calling us to do it? Because if God's calling us to do it, what's the cliche? Where God guides, God provides, right? Where God leads you, God will take care of it. He always does. So in your life, however God is leading you this, this week, hang on to that promise. He's there to help. He's leading you to the life you really want. Respect his guidance. Receive his help. Follow his leading in your life, and you'll produce the fruit of the Spirit. Maybe you're here and maybe you've never crossed the line of faith in your life. If that's where you're at, I'd love to give you an opportunity to just receive Christ into your life, begin that spiritual journey, and to realize that even now, if you sense God is tapping you on the shoulder, his spirit is already at work in your heart and in your life. So I'd like to ask everybody to bow their heads and close their eyes. And if you'd like to become a follower of Jesus, you can begin that journey by repeating this prayer after me. Say, dear God, I thank you for loving me. Thank you for sending Jesus into the world. I believe he died on the cross for my sins. I believe he rose again. Forgive me for my sins. 
Give me the gift of eternal life. Help me face the challenges that I'm up against. God, I surrender my life to you. In Christ's name. And friends, with every head bowed and every eye closed, if that's your prayer today, I'd just like to ask you to slip your hand in the air just to acknowledge that you're gonna follow God today in your life. You're surrendering to him today. Just slip your hand in the air and reach out to him. God, we thank you for each person reaching out to you, experiencing your love and your goodness in their heart and life. We pray that your spirit will fill them with love and joy and peace, forgiveness. And God, we thank you for the promise that you're always with us, that you do not leave us as orphans, that you never abandon us. We give you thanks for each of these individuals today. In Christ's name, amen.